Uh, our next speaker is Jim, Jim Slaven, who's uh, come all the way from uh, uh, Glasgow, Edinburgh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's got to be a start, <laughs> uh, Edinburgh place that says, yeah, yeah. Uh, founding member of the James Tobacco Connolly's Society, speaking today about Chiki Cohen, McLean, and his pamphlet, The War After the War, which is recently been republished by Mr. Rodic History Group and is on sale outside. Okay, so I'll hand you over to join us here when we speak for about 20 minutes and then we can have questions and contributions. Thanks. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, I'd just like to say thanks to um, Jeff and everyone else for inviting me down for the organisers. Like it's a fantastic event, fantastic space. And uh, it's great that we're having a, a talk about uh, John McLean, somebody who's really, uh, really rather unheralded in terms of uh, socialism and working class politics. And hopefully events like this can change that. It's also good to be in Bristol. I've never been to Bristol before. I flew to the airport a couple of times, but I've never been. And it was interesting this morning walking uh, just through the city, how similar it is to Edinburgh, because of just the students and the, the change in the place that you can obviously see with the, the history in Bristol and the change in nature of it and the disparity in wealth. You see homeless people and then obviously a lot of wealthy people exactly the same as you would see in Edinburgh. People living in the same parts. And then I, I ended up in Marathon Hell <laughs> but, uh, because I didn't know where I was going. Every time I turned the corner there was people cheering and which was confusing for me initially. And then there was runners and there was barriers and there was armed police and there was I thought to myself this just isn't happening to me. So I feel like I've done a marathon getting here, but I, I made it. So I think what I'm going to do is speak a little bit about John McLean, but really give it a sense of his political trajectory, how World War fitted in with that, and also the broader international context, the, the other people that were in John McLean's company opposing the war and how they viewed themselves in an internationalist context and perhaps then open up the discussion about where we are now in terms of where that radical history, how that impacts on our thinking and our strategy going forward and how John McLean is perceived uh, in Scotland certainly mostly has been a sort of Scottish nationalist, or a left nationalist, but he's perceived very much through that prism of being somebody who's in favour of Scottish independence, rather than how he viewed himself perhaps as, uh, as very internationalist. So I think those sort of questions about working class organisation and strategy and nationalism and internationalism are obviously very relevant to us. So maybe that would be better having a discussion about that rather than just listening to me for an hour because <laughs> I'd get bored listening to myself for an hour, never mind uh, yourselves. So in terms of uh, John McLean, I just first of all, exactly as the Chair was saying, this pamphlet, The War After the War, has been republished and uh, I think it's a great job of Br uh, Bristol Radical History Group that republished this because it's an important document. John McLean doesn't actually, as we sit here, there isn't a collective the works of John McLean, his writings haven't been brought together in a sort of collective volume, which um, undoubtedly should be. But this pamphlet, The War After the War, was an important staging post in John McLean's uh, development. And in terms of McLean's history, he was uh, his parents and, and his wife's parents as well were Highlanders who had been exiled in Glasgow in the ten times of uh, industrialisation. And then we're mixing there with other Highlanders, and all the Irish immigrants and what have you. So that's the context in which John McLean became politicised through that very, very important term, that history of Highlanders' exile and his family's experience at the hand of uh, uh, landowners, etc. And then he comes to Marx and he becomes a school teacher, but during the day he's teaching kids and at night he's, he's teaching uh, Marxian economics. So that's where he builds his reputation as a young man. And right up until the, the First World War, McLean's involved in various campaigns. What's interesting about McLean right off is that he's involved in industrial campaigns. He's, a, he's famous as being an educator and famous as being a narrator. And he's travelling around Scotland and England and he's uh, speaking at various industrial disputes and he's speaking at factory gates and pit heads, etc. 
but at the same time he's also working with women who are organising wrench bikes and events like that and he's trying to be a sort of bridgehead and bring the two together so he's working in industrial struggles and within working class communities with men, with women and he's trying to, to bring that together and recognising that some sort of collective actions are way ahead and so for that perspective it's important, it's interesting because not everybody was doing that at the time but also because the statehood of Mark Duke early doors has been, has been a, a serious problem to him. In terms of his uh, organisational background, McLean was involved with the Social Democratic Foundation and then he was involved in the, when it became the British Socialist Party. And that's interesting because he's often seen, if you read uh, McLean's, I suppose his most famous biography is uh, by Nan Milton, who was not only his biographer, but was also his daughter. And then that, you get the impression it would be very close to James Connolly and his politics being very similar to James Connolly. And that's only true after the Easter Rising and after the Russian Revolution. Up until the period in the run-up to the war, McLean's very uh, loyal to the organisations he's in. And at that point, he's opposed to Irish independence and he's opposed to the Scottish home group. At that point, he would have been opposed to independence Scotland as well. And then we come to the, the, the World War, and that's where we claim really that is for him the, the crucial point in his political development. He recognises that Glasgow is absolutely crucial as the second city of empire in terms of the work that's going on there with munitions and ships and all the type of stuff that's going on with militarism and the run up to the war, you can see it. And then when the war comes, McLean is very clear that he's, uh, opposed, he's opposed to the war and that the working class and the socialist movement should be at the forefront uh, opposing, opposing the war. And that is obviously a huge break with people like uh, Henry Heinemann and, uh, and others. And that, that has a huge effect on McLean. But of course, the, the other interesting aspect of this is that McLean, with Connolly, and other people like uh, Sylvia Pankhurst and there's other people here, but they're in that sort of small but very uh, revered sort of group of uh, international socialists who, who would be opposing the war, obviously Lenin, and Lenin recognised in McLean somebody who was particularly noteworthy. He mentioned him several times in his writings. Uh, McLean was made one of the vice presidents of the Soviet Republic. And he was also made the Soviet consul in Scotland as well, a position he never really looked to take up because just after he was given it, it was one of the times he got arrested. But it shows that Lenin had him marked out as being somebody who was uh, extremely, extremely important. But what's interesting is the connections that exist sort of below the surface between these people in the sense that we're talking about James Connolly for Edinburgh, we're talking John McLean, and we talk about Lenin in Russia. And there were also people like Jack Reed, who, Jack Reed is the American journalist who was uh, had a remarkable life himself. And on the way to Russia, Jack Reed stops off in Germany to interview Karl Liebknecht. And Karl Liebknecht is also mentioned in exactly the same paragraph as Lenin talks about the plane, he talks about Liebknecht. So there's a connection there right away. And in the United States, we also have uh, Eugene Debs. And Eugene Debs is somebody who James Connolly had worked with in the Wobblies and somebody who James Connolly had in 1908 when Debs stood in the presidential elections. Connolly had toured the United States supporting Debs. And then later on, McLean has a connection with Debs because McLean, when Debs is in prison, McLean's writing to it. I've been in touch with the Debs Foundation, I actually try to see if we can get rid of the letters, because McLean is writing to Debs and to Debs' brother when he's in jail, saying that he's off from solidarity and given his experience he's been a political prisoner etc. So there's a whole lot of connections there which are fascinating and I think that we need to, there's a, a job of work in terms of radical history trying to connect that. In terms of the work in Scotland, uh, specifically around about Maclean, the other interesting angle which um, is, is interesting but is probably slightly problematic for people is the connection that we have Maclean with anarchists in, in Glasgow. And the reason that's interesting is because you know, people like, uh, people familiar with Patrick Geddes, the, Patrick Geddes is uh, born in Aberdeen, he's famous for being in Edinburgh, being involved with um, 
old town, saving the old town for the gentrification effectively a uh, hundred years ago. And he's seen as being a sort of urban planner or sociologist and people like him for his urban gardens and that type of thing. But he's actually much more interesting than that. Geddes had a friendship with Peter Kropotkin and also with uh, the Recluse family, the French anarchist Elise Recluse and his nephew Paul Recluse. And they stayed, Paul Recluse was on the run from anarchist bombing campaign at the beginning of the 1890s and he actually goes to Edinburgh and lives under a false name with Patrick Geddes. And if you go to Edinburgh, if you go to Edinburgh, you see the uh, camera obscura. He had a sword in that, and he was called the uh, Outlook Tower at the time. And the clues actually lives there, works there under a false name. And at the same time, him, uh, Kropotkin, even people like Emma Goldman, they were travelling to Scotland and going to Glasgow, and they were organising against the war initially, some of them. And they were organising anarchist groups trying to work with some left-wing groups, including McLean, try to get themselves organised. But what's crucial about that connection is that Kropotkin and the Clues end up being pro-war, and that leads to a break with Connolly. And so you have a situation where, James, if you read James Connolly's writings, it's interesting because he never mentioned John McLean, which is interesting, but he also he mentions Peter Kropotkin, but doesn't he mention the fact that he knew him, and that he knew him for Edinburgh, and that's partly to do with the fact that he was on the run for the army, so he didn't really want to speak about the fact that he was born in Edinburgh, he was only one for the army, so he was a bit, Connolly was always a bit sketchy about his biographical history. But there's, there's a record in a, a correspondence with Geddes, where he refers to sitting up in James, uh, James Court, which is just off of High Street, it was a slum at the time, with Peter Kropotkin in the 1890s, and they were arguing about Karl Marx. Kropotkin didn't like Karl Marx very much at all. He was always talking about people being infected with German ideas, which he meant by it. So they didn't, they didn't go in. And um, Geddes was um, much more into cooperative organisations. He wasn't really for socialist organisations either. So apparently they sat up all night arguing about this and playing the piano. The interesting thing about that is their neighbour in James Court in the same year as James Connolly. So we get a sort of sense of what was the type of dynamic that was happening in Glasgow and in Edinburgh at that time. And so we need to, I think, try and see a way of connecting all these different dots about working class politics, about socialists against the war, but about how they were trying to organise themselves in an inclusive and internationalist way. So, if we look to McLean and his legacy now, the interesting thing for me has been that in the 2014 independence referendum in Scotland, McLean, Connolly never gets a mention at all, but um, McLean only occasionally gets a mention for Scottish Nationals on the basis that he would be in favour of the independence. But that is a very, I think, selective and narrow way of looking at it. And so what we need to do is to uncover some of that radical history that's there and then perhaps input that into us moving forward and thinking how we can occupy that space within working class communities. And I'm thinking, I don't know what it's like in Bristol, but when I think a hundred years later, if you look now at left organisations in Scotland, they are still led by middle class people. If you look at the Labour Party in Scotland, the two candidates for the leadership are both privately educated. So McLean and Connolly would have understood that dynamic exactly, the balance of forces that we have understood. The question for us is where are the working class voices, where are the working class leaders within our own political organisations and movements and how do we get to a situation where we can we can be a bit, no emulating them, but we can begin to begin the process of thinking about the world the way they thought about the world. And McLean eventually broke with Henry Heidman, Connolly obviously had a he had a difficult relationship with, well, with people, but he had a difficult relationship with Heinemann and De Leon, partly, partly on the basis of class, but he was just unable to accept that working class people should uh, just be quiet and follow middle class leaders, whether it was in social organisa uh, socialist organisations or, or anything else. So I think we need to be honest about McLean, about his political trajectory, about the, where this pamphlet sits in there, where the, the world war fits in there, where his internationalism fits in there. And I, I think part of that is about recognising that it is interesting that there's an unpublished PhD in Edinburgh which 
places John McLean and James Conley in the same room once at a meeting in Glasgow. Nothing to doubt it, that it's true, but might have met other times as well. But I think the, the notion that um, they were politically close in the run up to the Easter Rising or in the run up to World War One is just it just isn't it isn't it backed up by any any evidence, I don't think. So we need to be honest about that. And the interesting thing is also to look at it from the perspective of that international connection. So McLean's real connection to Ireland was Larkin, and Larkin and Conley obviously had a different, difficult relationship as well. But Larkin was in the United States at the time of the Easter Rising, in, in prison as well, part of that time in Sing Sing. So when he gets out in 1917, the first thing he does, he's in correspondence with McLean all the time. McLean um, was a good friend as well with his family. And the first thing he does when he gets out of prison in 1917 in New York is he sets up the James Connolly Club, which is meant to be a focus for debate and dialogue between uh, left groups, uh, anarchist groups, Irish groups as well. And the first speaker at that was Jack Reed, who just returned to Moscow and was in the process of writing 10 Days of Shooting World. And so he's the first speaker at the James Connolly Club in New York. So we get the connection there between these people who seem disparate and who maybe oppose the war for different uh, uh, different reasons, for different perspectives, but they're all connected, they're all mixing in the same in the same company, they're all communicating with each other. And I think there's a lesson there for us in the sense uh, they didn't have the internet or transatlantic flights, but they, they seem to manage a bit better than us in terms of joining up with organisations and making that connection and also letting working class voices come through and take uh, leadership in some of these issues. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> some interesting stuff there. I'm sure people want to pick up on these questions. Or... So. Yeah, you, you said that um, John McLean was against uh, Scottish independence in the beginning, but that he was used in, in the referendum by, mm. by nationalists to want to stick. So how, how has that, did he change his position or has he been misused or what, what do you understand it was internationalist but, but you do also have national, yes, I'm from Wales, um, we, you know, many of my colleagues are for Welsh independence but they're internationalists, so yeah. I would be a favour of independence for Scotland but I wouldn't be a nationalist, I would be an internationalist but yeah. so I, I appreciate what you're saying. The interesting thing with John McLean is he just did change his position, his own record is saying he's completely opposed to Irish Home Rule, Completely opposed to the Scottish Home Rule, if it was a complete diversion, it wasn't, it wasn't interested in one little bit, it was really quite critical there. And what happens is he's in prison during Easter Rising, and Easter Rising happens. And if you read these biographies, especially the ones that are written by Scottish people, they tend to say, Oh, that's what happened. You know, he was really pally with, with James Connolly, and then because they executed James Connolly, he decided. That, uh, but that's not really right. He didn't get out of prison until 1917, and it's really what's happening in Russia. That's really the catalyst for him actually thinking through where am I here, what's happening, and then he says actually the British state, it would be better breaking the British state up in terms of working class strategy, in terms of socialist action, that's the correct position to take. Now, there's, there's a whole number of issues around about why is that not really spoken about, and a lot of the writers who would write about John McLean in Scotland, and the truth is people outside Scotland didn't often write about them at all, like, so it's so Scottish people. And they would tend to be people who would come to his politics for that perspective of pro-independence. So one of the explanations you have for a story, and for instance, uh, the one who brought you Conley, uh, McLean the most, James D. Young, who I don't like to slide James D. Young because he's not here to defend himself, he's sadly a die like, but he says that, that in the run-up to the world, uh, First World War, the reason McLean had the position he had on the national question in Scotland and Ireland is because it was, it was hidden. He didn't really know these disputes were going on. That, Heinemann like controlled the party so much that these McLean had just missed these discussions or they were they were really taking thoughts with Connolly and that had taken place before he was a prominent person in it and that's how he I think we can really accept that. You know, I mean the truth is these were really, really live issues within the socialist movement. They were big questions. And if you read James Connolly's works, whether it's his journalism or it's his theoretical works, whether it's his correspondence. He talks about very little else like, he's, he's very, very clear on what his position is. So I didn't think we can assume that they were really pally and they just didn't realise the different positions were. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not right. What happened is McLean, the World War, is a, and, the, and the state pressure on him, he's in prison five times, he's under complete uh, attack for the state, 
all the time for the comrades as well, who peel off either support in the war or who are certainly lukewarm to his, to his type of approach to things. And during that period, there's Easter Rising, there is a brutal British backlash in the executed leaders, including James Connolly, and then there's the Russian Revolution. And all of these things impact on McLean, and he says, actually, wait a minute, things have changed. And that does, that's, there's no bad thing about that. He says things have changed, actually, and the British state is no longer got to be the vehicle for emancipation of the working class. Working class people in Scotland, in England, Wales, and in Ireland should be organising themselves to break up the state. Right. It's not often I'm concerned that a guest speaker speaks um, for too short a time, uh, but um, <laughs> could you say a little bit about the war after the war, uh, the, the pamphlet, what, what it was about, and uh, you know why he wrote it? And um, could you also add a few comments on the relationship or lack of a relationship when the Communist Party uh, was formed and why John McLean didn't join it and what happened after that? Yeah, no, I mean, it's just saying there are more questions than that. Oh, actually. Anyone else wants to ask anything that was time for us? Go, Jim, to come back. Go. I'll let Jim come back. No, they have two good points. I mean, in terms of the pamphlet itself, I think what's important about the pamphlet is it tells you, it's a great example, firstly, in McLean's writing on economics and his approach to Marxian economics, which is one of his big things in the run-up to the war is educating working class people on Marxian economics. And the, the, his, his class notes, actually, are still like a very good place to, to have a look at that. But also the war after the war gives you a sense of that. And the context for it, really, is about the dispute that's going on within the, the Labour trade union movement about how to approach the war in terms of state strategy. So some of the state strategy is about encouraging workers obviously to increase output and to, to support the war effort. And McLean is one of these people who say, actually, wait a minute, what is happening here is workers' rights are being diluted and the working class is going to be weakened after the war. So his sense of the war after the war is it's going to be economics, it's going to come back to class, and so the working class have to be prepared for that, we have to be organised for that. In terms of the uh, the Communist Party stuff, it's, it's quite fascinating, because obviously one of the great what-ifs, and there's loads of us, but one of the interests in what-ifs is that McLean never ever made it to Moscow. He was invited to go to Moscow, Newburgh, like an open invitation for Lenin and what he thought to go. He was called the also the Scottish Lenin, and he was encouraged to go, his comrades encouraged him to go in between periods of imprisonment, if nothing else, just to get out of the, get out of the hands of the state. But he refused to go on the basis that he would only go if he got the proper visa and it was all official. And so we then know what would quite happen. Of course, other people did go, and they successfully lobbied for what would be the creation of the Communist Party of Great Britain. And McLean was opposed to that from the outset. Many of his comrades supported it, and there then is a, a sort of major dispute, which leads, I suppose, to if people are, um, have read stuff about McLean for other people, there's then the, the sort of emergence of memoirs later on that actually the only reason he opposed the Communist Party Great Britain was because he was sort of mentally ill. He, he did a breakdown in prison and that he wasn't thinking straight. I'm not sure many of us would necessarily agree with that, given what's happened in the last 100 years, but yeah, um, that was that was part of that quite bitter fallout that he had with many of his comrades. And his thinking at that time was to lobby, as we're saying, for a Scottish Communist Party. And he ends up forming his own party. But the idea is that no, why should we have a Communist Party in Britain? He no longer had faith in that sort of British road to socialism and he believed that actually we've got a Communist Party, it should be in Scotland and there should be another one in England and another one in Wales and another one in England. And obviously uh, that was rejected and they pushed forward with the CPGB and become quite nasty. Mm -hmm. Jim, anyone, anyone else want to check in? I think, Jim. Yeah, just like to ask what, what you think about I mean, my understanding of, of McLean's, um, an aspect of McLean's uh, support or argument for Scottish independence was its, its weakening of the, the imperial centre, really. the fracturing of, of, the, of, of Great Britain would represent a blow against imperialism and the, the influence and the, the power of, of the British imperial power. 
Um, I'd be interested to know what you think about the, the, the merits of, of his position then. And also bringing that to today, where you think um, that might lie in, in present circumstances, independence of Scotland. Is, is there any element of, of uh, that striking some kind of blow, uh, still influential and, and still an imperial power? Um, so, just like to talk about that one. Are you ready? It's yeah. similar to that question. It's that point about in, in respect to the claim was the position of non independence and independent Ireland a tactical view of this is how you get the emancipation of the working class? We can't align the state, the British state is too ingrained. So, within a sort of Scottish perspective, some Scots, not all the Scots, within the independence movement, would take the view that. It's like you wouldn't be nationalists, but would vote for independence as a, view, as a way towards a socialist republic, which could then influence other countries to build up momentum. Ideal. Yeah, I think it's one of these uh, questions which is fascinating because obviously it's such a live issue for in Scotland certainly, but presumably uh, well, certainly in Ireland as well. Still, and I mean, what's I think when we're talking about McLean and we're talking about independence. We have to remember that one of the other things that McLean spoke about in the same context as that always was about class patriotism. It was about the idea that this was actually, this is about working class people. It's about how do we change the dynamic? How do we get emancipation in the working class? So it wasn't about changing flags. It wasn't about saying, you know, Scotland should be independent and just so we can have like a Scottish ruling class. We shouldn't be independent, and if we think about it in the context we're in just now, the SNP's position on the Scottish independence referendum in 2014 was that we would have an independent Scotland with the Queen as head of state, where there would still be a British army, we would still use the British pound, the Bank of England would be the land of the last resort. Now, that is a complete anathema to the independence that somebody like McLean was talking about. So we need to be making sure we're talking about the same thing, and a lot of the times what, what independence, as it's sometimes portrayed in the run-up to the referendum and now, is much closer to uh, sort of dominion status and home rule that they would have understood in that period 100 years ago than it is what they would have understood as an independent workers' republic, which is what McLean and Conway were talking about. And the very fact that I'm talking in these terms, a workers' republic is obviously a certain state construct which is um, different from what we have and what's been proposed for independent Scotland. So I think that is important. We do have to remember that concept of class patriotism. And, and I, I tend to think McLean doesn't have the same output in terms of writings as Connolly does. But if you read Connolly's writings on it, which presumably influenced McLean greatly because he came then to be, to be referring to it a lot, Connolly's clearly influenced by the, the Paris Commune. He's influenced by people like the communards who were exiled in, in Edinburgh who living under false names. So Leo Melliot, one of the Paris communards who was exiled in Edinburgh and was involved in the socialist movement while Connolly was living there, who was uh, extremely prominent in a, a really sort of hardline revolutionary working class attitude. And that and, and Connolly celebrated the Paris Commune every year for the rest of his life. Like, so these are things that are very important to him. And that's why I think the construct of, of workers' republic is important because they seem to be taking, they've taken some sort of inspiration for the Paris Commune and we need to be made clear what that's about for them. So when we talk about Scottish independence now, I'm always very reticent, although I said earlier, just to my cards on the table, I would vote for Scottish independence because I still do believe that ideally you break up the state in terms of that would be the best thing for working class people I think, in Scotland, England, Wales, Ireland, whatever, the British state broken up would be a good thing. But, I think if we had the vision the SNP of an independent Scotland, it would make a difference, not wouldn't it? That's why I'm not supporting the SNP. So it's complicated, and sometimes McLean's name gets used in a way which isn't misleading him because he, he did it and he's like supporting independent Scotland, but they're not quite doing justice to, to McLean's vision here. They are working class uh, independent Scotland, which was about socialism. Anybody else? Uh, thank you. Um, well, going back to this war after the war, um, you've implied at least that the war after the war is about 
you know, after the war, the class war. Um, but the actual war after the war um, for this country was to invade Soviet Russia by Archangel and Romance, wasn't it? And the, the, the TUC and the working class, as I understand the history, particularly in the London docks, stopped that um, by the stop of, stopping of uh, armed shipments uh, for Poland that was invading Russia. Um, but did McLean also write something called The Coming War with America? Yeah. Um, so could you maybe go into a little bit more detail about, you know, what was the war after the war in John McLean's mind? Was it just the class war or was it, you know, the invasion of the Soviet Union by Britain and 19 other countries? I could just, this thing about a coming war with America is an intriguing title for a pamphlet, isn't it? Yeah, well, it is. Well, I mean, I think the crucial thing about McLean and about this pamphlet is his view of how that's playing out in Glasgow. That's, his, that, that's what's said. There's a debate going on in Glasgow in terms of the trade unions, in terms of the, some people obviously support the war against the war. And this is McLean's input into that discussion. He's saying, actually, what we need to be doing here is thinking what's coming down the road here with imperialism, with Britain, and all of that stuff that's got to be. And obviously, that's crystallised later into the state strategies you're talking about with the Soviet Union. And that's the context within which he's writing that pamphlet about trying to say, actually, we need to be thinking about working class people and organising on that basis, about class patriotism rather than the sort of chauvinism that was happening at the time. Anybody else? What was McLean's uh, uh, relationship with Bruce Gallagher? Well, and, and that comes back to the point that the gentleman was making there. It was at one point very good, and then after the CPGB and the, the fallouts they had after that, and we could tell by Gallagher's memoir, it wasn't the other sort of bitter fallout over, really over the Communist Party, but I suppose over, we could say, over strategy. questions in terms of the current context in terms of we'll talk about the Scottish independence and we recognise that in the international trade but there's things within Britain and in terms of that context of sort of Corbyn within England and what's happening in Scotland and the right of the Labour Party and that sort of stuff so is there any parallels about making those strategic decisions about who you link up with for the greater good or is it all short term I don't like him so sort of the gene people's front type of argument which often happens within the left yeah well I've never been a member of any political party, so I don't have any sort of party line to, to promote or, or to criticise other ones. I, the, uh, I mean, I think well, the, the lesson we need to learn, from my perspective, the lesson we need to learn is about, is about class, about working class organisations, it's about people like the Queen and Connolly and how they develop that class analysis, and that is largely missing now in the sense that the voices in Scotland that I hear, they usually on the left. They're not working class, they didn't live in schemes, they didn't, they didn't understand the daily struggles of working class people. And if you look at a whole the number of key issues, they would be probably on the wrong side of the class. So we need to, I think, be looking at the example of people like McLean and thinking how do we get back to making that connection between industrial political struggles and working class communities in their day to day lives. And that, that seems to meet in Scotland at the moment to be missing. Now that's partly to do with political context that we've mentioned about everything in Scotland being viewed through the prism of Scottish nationalism. That's partly the obstacle. But it seems to me there might well be parallels with what's happening in England as well, in the sense of um, Corbyn, momentum, different things that are happening. I'm not sure how they really dare to work in the past community. But I, I, that's just my outside observation. Anyone else? Yeah. The time, I mean, it's God knows how long since I read the claim writings, and, and even longer since I read the biography. But I always remember his, uh, his the line I, from the from the uh, when he's being shot, he's in the in the dock. He says, "I stand here not as the accused, yeah. but as the accuser of capitalism, dripping okay, yeah. blood from the head to toe." There's no compromise of any kind, obviously, in what in in any of his opinions, the way he put them forward. But he was also at work, he was working at a time when the working class itself was active yeah. Yeah. in massive levels of industrial dispute, massive levels of industrial action, which went on uh, right until 1926, until the disaster of the general strike. 1919, there's discussion this country is the closest to revolution that it's ever, you know, people say it's the closest that it's ever been. 
So that's my view of McLean, is, is that revolutionary? But that's what I understand it now. Um, but when you talk about working class people, working class organisation, if McLean and Co, there's a question about all of those people, and, and again about Conley, about what kind of organisation they should have built, or could have built, or would have built, or all of those, you know, those hypotheticals. But isn't there something to be learned from that absence about organisation? I'm not, so, and I'm not saying what kind of organisation we need now, but isn't there something about that? Because it's a chick, it's a chick, It feels to me at the moment like chicken and egg. You know, why is it? Uh, you know, no disrespect. I don't mean to be disrespectful to Corbyn in any way, but you know, it's a pretty mild social democracy in the face of you know incredible you know a crisis of confidence almost in the ruling class, certainly in this country and in internationally. And so what, what is it that would, at the same time, very incredibly low levels of working class organisation, of, of activity, you know, hardly a strike occurs. So for those two, what, you know, what, what I'm not saying what kind of organisation would we need, I think drawing pictures of that is probably a waste of time, but what could we learn from, from their experience, those fantastic people, what could we learn from their experience about how we might conduct ourselves now in, in relationship to these various things? That must have occurred to you while you've been doing this work. I'm just curious as your opinion. I think one of the one of the things that strikes you about McLean or about any of the people that are mentioned in that period is the the confidence and the ambition they have. That they would understand the balance of forces as they exist at the moment. Or it was a different context in terms of class activity and industrial disputes and that type of thing. But they they were able to think in a way which we seem at the moment to be very limited in how we can think. They were able to think about, like, let's have a work as a public, let's break the state up. What, these things all seemed incredible. When Connor was talking about the uh, Irish Republic, people were even arguing against the idea of home rule, including McLean. Do you know, they, even home rule seemed too far. And Connor was saying, no, actually, what we need is a complete break. We need an Irish Republic. We need to break the connection completely. Now, that seems to me that type of revolutionary, ambitious thinking is missing at the moment. Mm -hmm. Now, I agree with exactly what you're, what you're saying. I was at meeting London yesterday, we were talking about the same sort of things about how it's a, a, a web for working class organisations, anti fascist activity. Um, and the question of what type of organisation, I agree with you, like try to just like, pop one out there, isn't it the answer? We need that process to be a discussion that's happening, but it does seem to me that if we've got to learn something from them, then it has to be reinserting some confidence in our ability as a class to organise ourselves. I just still come back, back on that. I think that the, the thing that's changed is that we back in the 70s, 80s, 90s when I was learning my politics, there was lots of stuff we could learn that was still a look real and very lively. And it seems to me now, and we could argue with people about what needs to be done, it seems to me now I feel like it's time to be listening to people, what yeah. people have to say. Yeah. There's a kind of, um, people want to be heard. And I think working class people particularly want to be heard. The yeah. lesson from Brexit is we want to be heard. We don't care how much problem this causes you because we want to be heard. And maybe there's something in that rather than that, the, the middle class liberal guardian condemnation of those ignorant people who voted for Brexit. Maybe listening to thinking, say, why did the vote go in that way, and why did so many people vote to leave you, the EU? Quite rightly, in my view, actually. Um, what, are, what are the implications of that? What's the message from that? What can we learn from that? Maybe a bit of humility, perhaps, on those part. Those have been socialists for a long time. I think, and I think that's absolutely right. I think the left generally, all of us, will have to take some sort of responsibility for it. We're not very good, maybe, at listening. I think that's what needs to happen, and there needs to be an engagement. We need to have an honest assessment of where things are at, and we do need to have some sort of radical thinking about how we can re engage, reorganise, start afresh. And some of these problems, like you're saying, Brexit, we we'll Trump in America, and people talk about global Trumpism, and there's definitely, and there's a, it's not about, is it about race, is it about economics? These things are clearly over determined. But we need to be listening to what's happening. There's something happening. There's a vacuum there in the working class, and if we don't fill it, somebody else will fill it. Okay. Is, is there any um, documentary evidence that um, 
forgive me, I've forgotten the name of it, but whether it was the Scottish Republican Socialist Party or the Scottish Communist Party that John McLean actually did set up, is there much evidence as to what kind of model of a party that he wanted to set up? But was it immediately going to be kind of parliamentary? So therefore, had he kind of plugged into that debate between Gallagher and Pankhurst and Lenin about what sort of a Communist Party you want? And I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, in terms of the comment raising the question of organisation and today, uh, about the whole kind of, I don't know, 70 years between what Karl Marx wrote about the sort of Communist Party he envisaged when he wrote that, that the Communist Party shouldn't have any interest separate from the working class, and how that evolved into like the Leninist idea of an almost insurrectionary closed kind of vanguard party, and how that's evolved in the British context, not just with the Communist Party, but the various kind of Trotskyist parties uh, that we've been played with ever since. Yeah, well, certainly McLean was definitely the party he formed, and he was definitely a favourite standing student elections, he, he did view that as being part of it. I mean, I think one of the one of the things we need to watch in up with McLean, whether it's with Connolly, whether it's with anybody else a hundred years ago, or Marx's vision, none of these people have the answers. There's no, like, we can't just pluck what they said off the shelf and say, oh, that's what he wanted, so let's organise ourselves like that. That's that's exactly what we need to oppose, I think. We need to be listening and we need to be thinking of new ways of communicating, new vehicles, whether it's a parliamentary party, whether it's a party that stands in elections. As I say, I haven't been a member of any political party, so I'm maybe not the best person to ask about these things. But it seems to me, because McLean wanted to have a party that stood in elections, doesn't necessarily mean that's the right thing for us to be doing. James Connolly as well, obviously, formed several parties, stood in elections in Edinburgh, stood in elections in Dublin, and school. but that doesn't necessarily mean that we should stand in elections in Edinburgh. Thank you. Well, it's an interesting discussion, given we're coming up to the, uh, the centenary of the Russian Revolution. Um, yeah, that whole period, I mean, the Russian Revolution failed because it was isolated. You know, the whole premise of it would, it would be the spark to set off an international revolution, the international revolution never happened. Now that we then raises the question of the likes of uh, McLean and other revolutions in Britain, if they'd been more Leninist, if they'd been more willing to, to look for the insurrection, to look for the seizure of power, would there have been the international revolution that would have saved Russia? The, that raises the question, what, to what level was there a, an insurrectionary, revolutionary atmosphere within Britain you know, between 1918 well, 1917 and 1926, and whether a revolutionary party could have made a connection, could have overthrown British capitalism. I mean, the, the German Revolution failed. Um, if Maclean and the others had been willing to, you know, to form an earnest party and go for it, would they have succeeded? So another one of you will answer. Who knows? Yeah. 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 Right. It's just, I mean, it is interesting that McLean is still famous in some ways in comparison say, to Maxwell and Gallagher, but it was mentioned there. I mean, all these guys have all disappeared, but McLean's still lurking around. But I think what's interesting is that you've got he worked, he, as far as I remember him, he was primarily in Glasgow. But Glasgow was the second city of the empire then, and some of the, the reasons for that are still coming out. Like, for example, 31% of the owners of the, of the West of, um, of the slaves in, in the Caribbean were, were drawn on money in Glasgow. Like, there was a huge, you know, old aunties down the road had you know, £80 a year from coming out of the Caribbean. So that it was, in that case, it was one of the reasons why it was described as the same, one of the second city of the empire was, in actual fact, it had internationally huge uh, amounts of dosh floating around. And then the other thing, of course, is, I mean, they say that I think about a fifth of the ships were built in Glasgow uh, for the empire. Uh, and then you've got, see, the big arguments that were going on during the First World War about the armaments and the guns, making the guns, and that's where a lot of the strikes that took place. They took place within a sort of context of a debate within the Second City of the Empire about how to fight the war, not necessarily about, about you know, the working class. And so the, the, I'm not sure whether at that time, objectively, 
for Maclean struggling, say, with the rain strikes in Glasgow, that it was actually a context in which the end, you know, there, there could have been a revolution. And the other thing is, I mean, as you were saying, you, you, you haven't been in, in, a, in a political party, but I come from Lark Cole, uh, which is a famous city yes, in Lark Hall. And, so and it's maybe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> famous. <laughs> maybe not a city. But, uh, but uh, the, the issue is the division. The division within the Scottish society is still very much there. And I suspect in Glasgow, in the, in the, the, the first part of the century, it was still floating around. And with all due respect to the nationalists here, you know. We used to describe the Scottish Nationalist Party as tartan Tories. And the way that we were busy laying it out there, I don't think it's changed. Uh, and I think that for Maclean, it was more or less the same as we are now in Glasgow. That there were, it was a very complicated situation, very difficult to work in. Can I just say to you, if I would has any other remarks, he wants to make response to, to, to tell you, and then we'll wind up, okay? Because we have to move. You know, too late now, Mike. Oh, very, 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 very briefly. Very briefly. He's, he's my friend. Yeah, what? Well, go on, go, 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 go. Friend, go. <laughs> Well, <clears throat> it seems to me that at that time and now, the deep division in Scotland is between the landowners and the working class in the city and the people living in the country. So, how, how does that. Uh, uh, in pink on this discussion of what John McQueen was doing. Well, John McQueen also at one point, actually, interestingly, was in favour of independence for the Highlands. Mm. He also argued that because he had been like that party identity, being a uh, Highlander, he being put off the land by landowners was really, was very, very important to him. And that, well, I mean, what's important with the landowners, the highlands, the clearances, that type of thing, how that plays into it with the process of industrialisation is connected to the point that the, the gentleman made about uh, sectarianism and about the influx of highlanders and uh, Irish immigrants in Scotland and the tensions that that had, particularly in Glasgow, but in Edinburgh and Edinburgh as well. So that was, that was the context, and we can't, uh, there's no point in trying to sort of. Uh, I just didn't want, make, I didn't want that to be the whole focus of the discussion because when you talk about Scotland, that could be the whole focus of the discussion. But it certainly <laughs> was a problem then, it was the context then, and it is still, the, it's very much just below the surface, like when you talk about any of these matters, that's definitely not there. So that's, in terms of the, the Highlanders, the clearances, the land issue, it's still the same. And there's, actually, the SNP, interestingly, have got a big thing of land reform, but they're having to redo it because after 10 years in government, sort of realising the land reform, which was heralded as being the best thing ever, like, has made absolutely no difference there. Like. So they're now looking at it again, but they're obviously they're getting the criticism for it. So these dynamics in terms of um, in terms of these people who own the land and the people who live on it is exactly the same as it was.